Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim. It is always a pleasure to introduce friends of ours who have joined the show numerous times because they work on such amazing projects and we want to make sure that our listeners can experience their amazing projects. And one thing that our listeners have not experienced yet, Tim, bless you, you just sneezed. One thing they have not experienced yet is your mood, which we need to get that out of the way ASAP. I'm doing well, thank you. And I was just blessed, so I'm even better now. Yeah, I'm really excited to introduce this conversation. We spoke with our old friend at this point, Casey Sherman, who is an amazing author. He's written some fantastic books. We've interviewed him, I want to say, at least three or four times now. Once on Empty Frames, our podcast about art crime. And he brings it again with this interview. It's about his new book that is available to purchase as of February 13th, 2024. It's called A Murder in Hollywood, The Untold Story of Tinseltown's Most Shocking Crime. And it's a really wild story. It's about Hollywood starlet Lana Turner and her boyfriend, mobster Johnny Stompanato, who was found dead on her bedroom floor. This is really the beginning stages of an early Me Too movement. This is also pulling the curtain back on the abuse that these stars and starlets went through that they endured in the 30s, 40s, and 50s in Hollywood and the corruption. So it's a glimpse into the dark underbelly of Tinseltown. And it's getting great reviews, by the way. I don't know if you've checked out the reviews. It's getting great reviews. Casey himself narrates the audio version. So if you want to get that story with that Casey Sherman vocal effect... I think people will enjoy that. Well, of course, it's getting great reviews, Lance. It's Casey Sherman we're talking about here. He is a uh, one-of-a-kind author, actually, and, and several of his books have been made into movies, too. And I think he spoke about this one being made into a, a TV series, potentially. So we wish him the best of luck with that. Go check out Murder in Hollywood. You'll definitely dig it. And Tim, people will definitely dig listening to this episode without the commercials, but they might not know where to go to get this. Could you please enlighten us? Sure. Our good listeners can now find Crawl Space Premium on Apple Podcasts. You can subscribe right there in the podcast app. But if you're not an Apple user, you can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. It's $4.99 a month. You get ad-free episodes, early releases, and our bonus show that everybody loves. So make sure to check that out. All right. We're going to break real quick for a commercial, and we will be right back with renowned author, Mr. Casey Sherman. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Welcome back to the podcast, author Casey Sherman. How are you today? Hey, good, gentlemen. Thanks for having me back. Oh, you're always welcome on the show because you always have these stories that you're telling. You're a prolific writer. So there's always a book that is in the works or about to be released in the next you know, few weeks. And we just love the way you put those stories together. But you finally today have given me the opportunity to live a dream <laughs> and introduce a guest from the car like they do on Sports Talk Radio. So joining us now is Casey <laughs> from the car. I appreciate it, guys. And uh, I'm calling from the car because I'm out in the field today. I'm working on a uh, case of a wrongfully convicted uh, killer, so to speak, in Massachusetts. So I'm just doing some gum shoeing and then uh, had to pull over and speak to you guys. Very cool. Wow. OK. Is that for a, a future book? It's for a, a magazine piece that I'm working on for Boston Magazine and potentially a book as well. Wow. It's a wild story. I'm just dipping my toes into it now. Hopefully it'll be a, you know, a great yarn like uh, the rest of my books. Yes, and they sure are. You, you uh, said that right. Your latest book, A Murder in Hollywood, the untold story of Tinseltown's most shocking crime, is another example of uh, just great writing and compelling stories. My first question is, do you ever stop writing? No, if I'm not physically writing, I'm writing in my head or I'm, you know, out in the field uh, looking for my next project. So again, the writing is the thing for me. That's what really gets my juices flowing. So I'm already, you know, thinking about not only the next book, but the next, you know, three to four projects that, you know, I, I might want to lend my voice to. Well, this topic, Tim introduced the book, A Murder in Hollywood. It covers a area that I am so fascinated with, which is the dark side of old timey Hollywood and those stories that you don't hear in the main media, like you got to dig a little bit for. But before we get to that, can you let our listeners know how the new year is treating you? 
I mean, you're you're super busy, but how's it going? How's it going so far in 2024? Yeah, 2024 has been pretty interesting already. You know, I'm just about to uh, go on a national book tour for a murder in Hollywood. I've just completed my 17th book, which will be out next year, which focuses on the Nathan Carmen case, which was a wild murder case on the high seas 2016 here in new england and that's a story that came out a lot differently than i had expected it to which is always great for me i love to get my head turned around when i jump into a project and i think i'm going to go into one direction and the evidence and the information pulls me into the complete opposite direction of where i thought i was going wow very cool well definitely can't wait to uh to read that one and it was great to finally get to meet you this year at crime con yeah no uh that was a A unique experience for me. I mean, writers, we live uh, kind of a solitary life. So the opportunity to get out there and talk to, you know, true crime fans, people that really love to read about investigations and kind of the, you know, the dark side of life was really interesting for me. I'm excited that I'll be back at CrimeCon in Nashville this coming May. So I'll continue to... uh, you know, visit if I can. And I just want to give a shout out to your publishing company, the Source Books, and Madeline, who always reaches out to us for your books to make sure that, you know, you're getting the publicity that you deserve. But that's an impressive company that you've connected yourself with. You know, I mean, I, I've worked with a lot of different publishers, you know, all the biggest publishers in the world. And, you know, when I partnered with Source Books for Helltown, it was just a, a, a perfect marriage. You know, I, I look to stay with this publisher, hopefully for the rest of my career, because they are true partners and not only only the, you know, creation of the idea, but also, you know, making sure that a lot of people, you know, have knowledge of this book being out and the stories that I cover. How did you find this story? One of my favorite films of all time is L.A. Confidential. So I'm I'm a sucker for those old time Hollywood stories, that film noir era uh, in both filmmaking and publishing the Raymond Chandlers of the world. So I, I was looking to lend my voice somewhere into that whole world. And my agent, Peter Steinberg at a United Talent Agency, he uh, sent me this, you know, just a little blurb about the Lana Turner case. Growing up, I knew about it a little bit. Um, I thought I knew what I knew. Once he said, look, you know, your publisher wants a big story from you. Helltown was a big story. So this might be a crime that was overlooked, you know, especially, you know, in the later decades. It was certainly sensational when it happened, but it's been forgotten by history. Can you bring something new to the conversation? And I said, give me a week and let me see if I can start to dig in here. And I I began to, you know, collect all the primary source documents, read up on every news article at that time to see how not only the rise of organized crime was shaped, but the rise of of Hollywood back in the golden era uh, was shaped as well. And I thought you've got two industries basically on a collision course, the studio industry of Hollywood and organized crime with Bugsy Siegel, Mickey Cohen, and others all working and and competing with each other in a very small town, which was Hollywood back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Yeah, it's really fascinating and incredible to see how those two worlds come together. And when you hear the name Lana Turner, you don't think organized crime. I mean, that's the last thing that you'd think of just as a regular person who's a fan of movies. You typically don't think about organized crime. But what is the premise of this? Let our listeners know, like, what does Lana Turner have in connection to organized crime? Yeah. So, you know, from a 30,000 foot view, guys, imagine that Margot Robbie or Jennifer Lawrence uh, woke up one day to find uh, a dead gangster on the bedroom floor of her Beverly Hills mansion. That's basically the story in a nutshell, how Hollywood's biggest star at the time, Lana Turner, you know, some people don't remember her, but she was Marilyn Monroe before Marilyn. In fact, Marilyn had basically stolen her entire identity, if you will, from Lana Turner. She was Lana's biggest fan. So Lana is the biggest thing in Hollywood for decades. Uh, But she's starting to age out. She's getting into her late 30s and she's not being offered those glamour roles that she was once offered as the ingenue or the uh, most beautiful actress in Hollywood. And she's gone through a series of very violent and abusive relationships uh, with men whom she later married. You know, Lana Turner had several marriages during the course of her life. And then, um, you know, out of the blue, a gangster named Johnny Stampinato begins to send her flowers and begins to send her candy and begins to send her all of these gifts in hopes of seducing Lana Turner. Now, Lana Turner had no shortage of, um, you know, male admirers, but there was something unique about Johnny, something that, you know, obviously she didn't know. Johnny was a tough guy. She didn't know that Johnny was the right-hand man of basically the godfather of Los Angeles at the time, Mickey Cohen. And Mickey Cohen and Johnny Stampinato, they didn't look at Lana Turner as a love interest for Johnny. 
they looked at Lana Turner as a mark, as a target, as somebody that they could exploit and extort, put into compromising positions, and then bleed her for all she was worth financially. And that's that's what they tried to do over a course of well over a year until Lana Turner decided to take her life back. Can you tell us a little bit about Lana's rise to fame in the uh, film business? Well, it's one of the most iconic stories in all of Hollywood history. It was Lana Turner who was sitting on a stool at an ice cream fountain in Hollywood when she was 15 years old, when she was ultimately discovered by a Hollywood talent agent. Now, that story has become part of Hollywood's legacy because once Lana Turner was discovered and put on the big screen, thousands of young women across the United States cobbled together bus fare and train fare, and they all traveled to Hollywood because they wanted to be discovered like Lana Turner was. So Lana was discovered when she was 15 years old and she was originally dubbed the sweater girl because, you know, even when she was underage, she'd been sexualized by the movie studios. They were putting her in, um, you know, tight clothes, putting her into compromising positions on screen and creating this kind of screen siren for this, you know, underage teenager. And one of the things that I thought was interesting, guys, when I was researching, now, you know, I, I wrote, I read a lot about organized crime in the book, but I really wanted to kind of lift the veil for uh, of the Hollywood system and show you what that was like back in the 30s and 40s. I mean, we're, we're dealing with the fallout of, of that culture now, you know, with the Harvey Weinsteins and with the Me Too. All of that goes way back you know, to the early uh, moments in Hollywood where you had these young stars who were victimized and brutalized by the studio. Uh, Lana Turner came up with Judy Garland, who Dorothy from Wizard of Oz, and they were being forced by the studios to work 70-hour work weeks to support their family-friendly studio films. Meanwhile, these kids are exhausted. These kids are being put on amphetamines, drugs. They're given a diet of chicken broth and cigarettes to keep going and keep their figures. So they're being destroyed from within, you know, very early on in their careers. Yeah, that's a really remarkable part of the story because when you hear in today's worldview, uh, the Me Too movement is typically considered something that happened around like 2015, 2016, you know, in that three or five years around that time period. But this is something that really, really goes far beyond that. This started decades and decades earlier. How was Lana Turner a pioneer in that movement? Yeah, well, I mean, that, and that's a great question. You know, she originally didn't think of herself as a pioneer in that movement, but, you know, she was subject and victimized, you know, by the studios who, again, when she was 15 and 16 years old, they would use her as arm candy for their leading men on the red carpets of Hollywood. You know, with the pre-presidential Ronald Reagan, who was in his late 20s, early 30s, was walking around with a 15-year-old Lana Lana Turner on his arm in Hollywood and nobody batted an eye to what male actors were doing, but every female actor in Hollywood had a morality clause. The reason why Lana was married so often is because she could not just have a boyfriend or she could not squire a, you know, a, a, an actor around town. If she fell in love with somebody, she had to marry that person in order to be seen with them. And oftentimes those relationships turn very dark. And I think Lana was always drawn to dark men in her life because her father was the victim of an unsolved murder in the 1930s in San Francisco. And he was a small time gambler who got in with the wrong crowd and ended up being beaten to death on the streets of San Francisco. And Lana grew up without a real strong male person in her life. And I think that's why she was, again, driven to these dark figures. And once she got into these relationships, the only way out for her at that time was to divorce these men. And that's after they had beaten her physically, uh, roughed her up emotionally, and basically stole every penny that th that she had. Gosh, that is so sad. And then how did she get involved with Stompanato? Again, another, another dark character enters her life, and she just thinks that he's fallen in love with her. She doesn't know that she's an extortion victim and that all the money that Johnny Stampinato is spending on Lana Turner comes from Mickey Cohen, the gang boss of L.A. And again, they're using that to lure Lana Turner into these compromising positions, drugging her, putting her in bed with a you know young woman, filming her and then, you know, selling that footage back to Lana Turner for millions of dollars. That's what Johnny Stampinato's mission originally was when he started to seduce Lana. But over the course of their relationship, Johnny Stompanato almost looks at himself like that character Chili Palmer in Get Shorty, 
the gangster who becomes a movie producer, he sees the success that Lana's having, and he wants to get away from the leg breaking of, you know, Mickey Cohen and his goons, and he feels like he can become, you know, a, a major player in Hollywood. And as, as he's doing that, he's subjecting Lana Turner to, a, a, a you know, mental and physical abuse. And Lana at the time, which is really interesting, she had started her own production company in Hollywood, which is something no actress did in the 1950s so she's a pioneer there where nobody else was doing it he wants to really gain control of her own career and she's doing so and she realizes the only way i can be a success is if i you know cut ties with johnny stampanato who she now realizes is a very violent and deadly gangster and when she tries to break it off with johnny johnny not only beats her and he's done that a number of different times but he threatens to kill her and then he threatens to kill Lana's teenage daughter and Lana's mother. And I think at that moment, guys, something shifted in Lana's brain. She realized the only way to get rid of Johnny was to take him off the map as a rival gangster would. So she killed him in the bedroom of her Beverly Hills mansion. You know, you'd said, imagine one of the stars today waking up with a dead gangster in their bed. How did this happen? How did it come to pass that Stampanato ends up dead in, in her mansion? Well, uh, a couple of weeks before the murder, Lana Turner is uh, nominated for Best Supporting Actress at the Oscars. And uh, she will not allow Johnny Stompanato to escort her to the Academy Awards. Instead, she brings her mother and her young daughter, and they have the time of their lives. You know, the, the career high point for Lana Turner. She doesn't win the award, but she felt like she had finally, you know, gotten the recognition of her peers in Hollywood. And at the end of the night, walking into her rented bungalow in Beverly Hills and putting her daughter to bed, she opens her bedroom door and she sees a lit cigarette in the corner. It's a dark room, but she knows Johnny Stampanato is there. And Johnny Stampanato is enraged. He can't believe that Lana has embarrassed him by not allowing him to be her date at the Oscars. So on the greatest night of Lana's life, Johnny beats her within an inch of life while her young daughter is hearing the screaming and the abuse from the uh, room next door. Cheryl Crane almost called the police and, and she didn't. So the next day, Lana is cleaning up her bruises, covering them up with a you know pound of makeup. And then she realizes, I've got to kill him. And as she's uh, buying things for the household, pots, pans, she buys an eight inch serrated knife. One that really you wouldn't use you know, to cut chicken breast or to cut vegetables. You know, she realized that this would be the murder weapon that she would ultimately have to use against Johnny because Johnny would turn violent against her. Again, it was their, it was part of their relationship. So he was going to beat her. And the next time that happened, she was going to take her life and her daughter's life and, into her own hands and kill John, Johnny when he was when he was close to her. And that's what she did. Now, as Johnny is lying dead on the rug of her Beverly Hills mansion, she calls a doctor, and then she calls her lawyer, uh, an attorney named Jerry Giesler. Now, you guys remember Johnny Cochran and his representation of O.J. Simpson. Jerry Giesler was the Johnny Cochran of the 1950s. He was the ultimate fixer. Every celebrity who got in trouble hired Jerry Giesler. You know, Johnny Cochran's actually the Jerry Giesler of the 1990s and 2000s, quite frankly. Uh, so this guy shows up at the Beverly Hills mansion and sizes up the situation. You've got a young man, 35 years old, dead, or 33 years old, dead on a carpet. You've got a bloody knife, and you've got Lana Turner. So there's no doubt that Lana Turner would have been arrested for first-degree homicide. You know, they call police right away. So Jerry starts to think, all right, so if she's um, arrested for first-degree murder, there's a likelihood that an all-male jury is going to convict her. There's also a likelihood that she's going to be put to death because the um, death penalty in the gas chamber were certainly uh, in use in 1958 in California. Well, what if we put the knife in Lana's daughter's hands? Cheryl uh, Crane, Lana's daughter, is 14 years old. Now, if the daughter had wielded the knife and not Lana, there's a likelihood that it would be called justifiable homicide. Because everybody, including an all-male jury, would have some empathy and sympathy for a young girl. That kind of sympathy was not available for Lana Turner. And that's, I think, what happened, which really dictated the rest of this crazy, crazy story. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. 
Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. It actually was the knife that Lana Turner had purchased, the serrated knife that was the murder weapon? That's correct. And how did they sort of weave the story to work Cheryl into it? You know, it was, I mean, kind of blind blind allegiance from a lot of the prosecutors and police officers at the time. And they listened to Jerry Giesler. They, how Cheryl was woven into the story was that, you know, Giesler put the knife in her, her hands and said that Cheryl had broken up a very, very violent struggle between Johnny and her mother, and she was protecting her mother and saving her mother's life, therefore jumped in and tried to stop the fight, and the knife was used. Nobody in Hollywood believed that was the case at all. Not Johnny Stampanato's boss, Mickey Cohen, who was on a tear through Hollywood to find Lana Turner and possibly kill her with his bare hands. Johnny Stampanato's own family didn't believe it. Uh, They called bullshit on it because here's Johnny Stampanato, a combat veteran from the Pacific War in World War II, how was a 13-year-old girl with a knife going to sneak up on him and stab him in the torso and kill him? It just didn't make a lot of sense for anybody that was smart in the room. But this was a great public relations campaign that Jerry Giesler, you know, kind of pulled over on the public and the Hollywood press at the time. And therefore, you know, the police officers and the DA's office ultimately led to a, an inquest, which was kind of a truncated murder trial for Lana Turner, where she had to basically give the performance of her life and and tell the jury and tell the press or tell the judge rather and tell the press that it was Cheryl that killed Johnny and not her. Now, that was a gamble that Jerry Giesler decided to make because there was really no guarantee that Cheryl Crane would, uh, you know, would have been let go or, or kind of let off by this crime. And she ultimately went to juvenile hall, spent several weeks there before the judge decided that it was justifiable homicide and she was allowed to leave. And what I do like about this story, guys, is Lana Turner has been looked at as a femme fatale for 60 years in Hollywood history. However, I think this story kind of elevates her and puts her on that pedestal as a feminist icon. Because what she really had to do was take her life back. You know, if she was murdered, then nobody would have been able to raise her daughter, Cheryl Crane. If Cheryl Crane was murdered by Johnny Stampanato, well, then, you know, Lana Turner, you know, would probably have taken her own life at that point. So she had to deal with evil and she did it the only way she knew how, which was defending herself. Hey, you just mentioned that Cheryl ran the risk of being murdered by the mafia because of this. I'm sure Lana Turner also did. And there was some danger that came with it after because Mickey Cohen was going through Hollywood on a rampage. But how does that relate to the relationship between Cheryl and Lana what was their relationship like was it strong enough where they could both understand like this is going to put us both in danger well I I mean it it ebbed and flowed it was a very uh I would say troubled relationship because every man that Lana introduced Cheryl to not only abused Lana but abused Cheryl one of Lana's uh husbands prior to Johnny Stampanato's involvement was an actor named Lex Barker who uh, took over the Tarzan role on the big screen from Johnny Weissmuller Lex Barker uh, uh sexually assaulted Cheryl for several years before Lana uh, found out about it and ultimately divorced Lex Barker and uh, and tried to shield her daughter from, you know, any wrongdoing in the future. But again, Lana was her own worst enemy at times because she was always drawn to dark men, including Johnny Stampanato, who she didn't know was a gangster when they met. But ultimately, when she found out evil and dangerous he was, she tried to break off the relationship and he just wouldn't let her do it. So I think, you know, Cheryl... Being the teenager that she was, listened to her mother, but more importantly, listened to her mother's lawyer, Jerry Giesler, and put all of her faith kind of in his word and his work. And ultimately, you know, she came out of it, as did Lana. Their relationship as mother and daughter continued to ebb and flow, you know, for decades. And Cheryl Crane never came clean, so to speak, and told the real story about what happened in that bedroom. And I think she did this to protect her mother because there was no statute of limitation on murder. And at any time, Lana Turner could have been charged with first degree homicide. And the reason why I feel so strongly about this, guys, is that Johnny Stampanato's family ultimately filed a wrongful death suit against Lana Turner and was about to take her to civil trial. Now, if Lana Turner, you know, was innocent in the episode kind of happened the way it was told to the media, there was no reason for Lana Turner not to take the stand again and describe what happened in her bedroom. But instead, she settled that lawsuit because she knew that 
any more testimony on her side would have opened her up to criminal charges. How did it go down, like, in, inside the bedroom? Like, how did it how, how did it actually work? And how long was Lana planning this? Like, did she, she hit a knife and, and was ready to use it when he was abusive? I guess there are only really three people that know exactly how it happened, and those are the three people that were at the mansion that evening, Johnny Stampinato, Lana, and Cheryl. And, and I, I think it was probably a subconscious purchase of Lana's the day before the murder to make that that purchase of that so-called murder weapon. She didn't know when she was going to use it. She knew that she would ultimately use it because every argument with her boyfriend, Johnny Stampinato, ended up violently, ended up with her being smacked around her bedroom or anywhere else that those two cohabitated with each other. So I think that, you know, the night of, of the murder, they got into an argument. And one of the reasons why they were fighting on this night is because, you know, one of Johnny's old friends surprisingly showed up at Lana Turner's mansion and told Lana a different version of Johnny's background and Johnny's life than Lana knew. Johnny was actually much younger than uh, he told Lana he was. In the, in the 1950s, you know, an older woman dating a younger man was a big no-no. And Lana was pissed off and shocked and, and and embarrassed by it. And I think, you know, when she expressed those concerns with Johnny, she knew Johnny was going to get enraged. She knew Johnny was going to beat her. So that's when she grabbed the knife, brought it to the bedroom where Johnny followed her, kicked in the door. They fought. He got stabbed. And he died. What does that say about, I mean, I guess we know what that says about the gender roles in, in old Hollywood and also, I mean, current gender roles in Hollywood. But an example of this is the difference between Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall was like 25 years. But that was fine because he was the older one, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Lauren, Lauren Bacall is 19, you know, and yeah. and I think, you know, Bogie was 45 when they started to date, which would shock people today, hopefully. But back, to your point, back in the 1950s, if it was a, a male actor or just a male in society doing those things to a female, nobody cared. You know, I mean, again, this is the era where you had ads in magazines showing a husband spanking his wife, you know, in a pictorial, you know, that sold uh, coffee or, or, you know, house cleaning apparatus. And if the house wasn't cleaned, you know, the wife got a beating for it. It's crazy to look at in the prism of 2024 what women as a, you know, as a whole were subjected to, you know, back then. And Lana, despite being incredibly famous, and incredibly wealthy, you know, she was uh, she was also victim to it. As a writer in 2024, how is it as a male writer in 2024 writing about this? How do you approach that? How do you tell the story of a actress, of a woman and all of the inequalities that are around that? As a writer, how do you approach that? Well, you know, I looked at it through the prism of my two daughters who are, who are in their 20s. So, you know, understanding what they are subject to in 2024 and what they would have been subject to in 1957 and 58, it angered me. And I really wanted to give Lana her agency. And I wanted to give her her power back because I think that's been taken away from her. It was taken away from her by every male she ever encountered, including John, Johnny Stampinato. It was taken away from her by the studio heads that, you know, brutalized her both physically and, uh, and mentally. You know, Lana was put under a morality contract with the studios where, you know, in the 1940s, she was dating a African-American jazz musician in Harlem. But the FBI was following her and creating a file based on this relationship that J. Edgar Hoover himself sent to the head of MGM, Louis B. Mayer. And uh, Louis B. Mayer did not want the starlet of Hollywood fraternizing with or socializing with or romancing with an African-American of any kind. So she almost lost her job and got drummed out of Hollywood based on that. <laughs> I have to make sure I heard this correctly. She was dating an African-American jazz musician. And who wrote a letter to, to the FBI? Uh, well, J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, you know, the, the head of the FBI himself had an agent follow Lana Turner in New York uh, to these various hotels where Lana and this jazz musician were being kicked out of because it was a, you know, interracial relationship. So there is a, a pretty thick FBI file that the director of the FBI sends to the most powerful man in Hollywood, Louis B. Mayer, who was Lana Turner's boss at the studio. 
And Louis B. Mayer, uh, you know, made sure that Lana ended that relationship because it was it had broken her morality clause with the studio. And she almost lost her entire career because she wanted to love somebody that wasn't, quote, unquote, wholesome and, you know, Midwestern American. You'd think that Hoover would have had something better to do. Well, Hoover, you know, was putting on nylons half the time. You know, Hoover was a strange cat and loved to pry into the sexual practices especially of politicians and Hollywood stars. It seemed that, you know, he had a certain fetish of, of finding out what people did behind closed doors in their bedrooms. And, uh, you know, I was startled at how, how large uh, the Lana Turner FBI file was when I was able to get access to it for the book and how she was followed, you know, city to city by J. Edgar Hoover's agents. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. Wow. Well, it, it, as if it wasn't bad enough that Hollywood had an underage girl problem, a double standard problem. It also has a, a pretty bad racist problem. As I said, I read a lot about organized crime in the book. So you, you've got gangland shootings. You've got bombings. It's very action packed. But I also, you know, you know who the gangsters are. You know what they do and they don't shy away from it. It's it's the Hollywood studios that try to come across as being wholesome, as being all American. But, you know, behind the scenes, you know, they're even worse than some of these gangsters are. And I wanted to examine the toxic masculinity of Hollywood at that time, certainly as it uh, relates to today, and peel the varnish back on uh, on what the practices were. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Can you talk a little bit more about that, about how the studios would take advantage of their actors? It is the mostly by contracts and things like that? Yeah, it was by contracts and, and you know, overworking their actors. As I mentioned, these kids, and they were kids, were working 70-hour work weeks because their parents didn't have a job. So these kids had to support their entire families. And that still goes on, you know, with today's child actors. And, you know, you look at the tragic demise of Judy Garland and how she succumbed to drugs and alcohol when she was in her 40s. I think she was 47 when she died. And everybody focuses on her personal decisions that led to her untimely death. But she was hooked on drugs by the studios when she was 13. So her demise actually happened when she was wearing the ruby slippers, you know, on the set of The Wizard of Oz and working outrageous, you know, work hours to crank out, you know, Hollywood and family-friendly films for the Hollywood studios. And when did the change come about? Because, you know, the studio system broke down and actors started to unionize and gain more rights. When did that start? You have... You know, Humphrey Bogart, for example, created United Artists back in, I think it was the early 1950s. I, I think you, the Red Scare had a lot to do with it. The Blacklist era in Hollywood had a lot to do with it, where, you know, actors, writers and directors were trying to gain some type of control over the, the industry that relied on their creativity to, uh, you know, to survive. And I think that, you know, it's been a slow progression but now you look at every major star in hollywood has their own production company and i think they all need you know they all uh have to you know provide a sense of gratitude to people like lana turner who were the first to do it now tell us a little bit more about this uh stompanato guy was he able to justify his his own behavior to himself no stompanato you know was a guy that grew up in illinois again he was a combat veteran uh, in the pacific theater in world war ii had a wife and child in Illinois, but could care less about them. You know, saw visions and, you know, stars in his eyes of what he could accomplish in Hollywood. And he makes his way to Hollywood, you know, through his relationship with a uh, with a British member of aristocracy, somebody who was very wealthy, a, a male who supported Johnny as he, they were going out to L.A. together. And Johnny was, you know, providing uh, or selling his body to this guy in order to get financial support. He needed to make it out west. Johnny goes out west and he's got two jobs basically off the bat. During the daytime, he's a gigolo, you know, lying poolside at the Beverly Hills Hotel. And he is selling himself to, you know, closeted gay actors in performance at the time. People like Liberace, people like Merv Griffin, who, again, could not outwardly say who they loved because, you know, the taboos of Hollywood did not allow them to do that at the time. So Johnny was selling his body to these actors and at night. He was serving as 
Mickey Cohen's, you know, blind side, basically protecting his blind side. Johnny became a bodyguard and a, a leg breaker and potential assassin for the Al Capone of Los Angeles. And this guy was murdered when he, you said, 32, 33? Yeah, he was, I mean, he was, he was young uh, when he was, when he was killed by Lana. But, uh, but he, you know, packed in a lot of, a lot of living, uh, you know, in between and certainly preyed on a lot of people. He just didn't extort, you know, Lana. He had extorted, you know, many famous people and, and people that didn't have fame, but had a lot of money. If, if you had a, a heavy pocketbook, Johnny Stampanato, you know, charmed you, seduced you and then took you for everything you were worth. Well, Casey, this has been uh, this has been another great chat. We're uh, excited to see your next book on sale February 13th, 2024, called A Murder in Hollywood. Is there anything else you'd like to say here uh, today? I'm really excited about the book launch. You know, I've got appearances in L.A., Texas, New York City, uh, throughout New England. We're um, developing or adapting the book right now into a feature film with uh, Terrence Winter, who created Boardwalk Empire. Uh, was one of the creative minds of the Sopranos, etc. Real big uh, power player, great creative mind in Hollywood, and understands this collision course of Hollywood gangsters and old time Hollywood glamour. And uh, we're you know we're excited to tell the story on the big screen as well. Amazing, amazing, and. Tim and I will be uh, first in line for that movie passes there when that hits the big screen. Right. But speaking of movies, you said that your big fan, one of your favorite movies is L.A. Confidential. That's right. That was an influence for me to get involved with A Murder in Hollywood. Uh, one, of, one of my all-time favorite films, a uh, great book by James Elroy. But in the, there's a, a scene in L.A. Confidential where two of the detectives, Bud White and uh, the uh, detective played by Guy Pierce, they stumble into the Cafe Formosa, which is a uh, an old-time Hollywood restaurant that still exists in West Hollywood. They approach a booth where Lana Turner and Johnny Stampanato are canoodling at the time, and Lana throws a drink in one of the actors' faces. It's kind of a comic moment in the movie, but that was really, I would say, my only um, knowledge of, of Lana and Johnny before I dove head first into this writing project. Oh, that's cool. It actually made me think of my closing question, which is, is there another movie that you're a fan of that is set in a different time period that you would be interested in finding a little nugget of a story within that? Well, you know, uh, it, th that's a really great question. There's a great book that's already been written. You guys probably know of it, but it's uh, it's called, I think, The Last Goodbye, and it's about the making of Chinatown, one of my all-time favorite films, a uh, great film noir starring Jack Nicholson and directed by Roman Polanski. Um, but I'm always looking for, you know, the story behind the story. So I'm open to ideas. Anybody in your, you know, listening audience wants to send me uh, some some ideas. I'm at I'm on X or Twitter, Casey Sherman, one, two, three. Um, I, I do have some ideas for a couple of the next projects that I have. I mentioned to you a book that I have coming out next year called Deadly Depths which is uh, a story about a young man with Asperger's sy uh, syndrome who took his mother on a deep sea fishing trip in 2016. The boat sinks, she drowns. He is a castaway on a life raft for seven days before he's picked up by a Chinese cargo ship fishing, uh, or I should, should say in the shipping lanes off New England, 100 miles off of Martha's Vineyard. So right there, you've got a pretty wild story. And this young man is treated as a, as a kind of a sullen, sad hero when he is uh, found and rescued and ultimately interviewed by the Coast Guard. And then the press understands that while the same young man was also the prime suspect in the unsolved uh, murder of his multimillionaire grandfather three years before, who was shot three times in the head, sleeping in his bed in Connecticut. So now you've got two crimes that this young man is implicated in. So this is the story that I weave together for Deadly Depths. And as I said, it's got a very surprise ending because I am not sure that this young man was guilty of the crimes that he was uh, uh, accused of. Wow, very cool. Can't wait for that one, too. This has been great, Casey. Thanks again for uh, joining us here today. We really appreciate it. My pleasure, guys. Al always a great conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Get back to your uh, gum chewing. All right, guys. Have a great one.